You may be seated. Before I begin to share with you some thoughts concerning today's gospel, I did want to extend a warm welcome to some of our visitors today. I know there are several of you here, and I, I welcome you. It's great to have you here. Um, Mike and Bonnie Callahan, who are, uh, were longtime members of St. Matthew's, but now they live in Northern California, are here visiting with us today. And so it's great. And, um, and then uh, my uh, mother has come out and checked up on me, you know. So, she's, <laughs> so that's my mother there next to my daughter. All those things you have to put up with in me, it's her fault. <laughs> Blessed are the meek and lowly, says Jesus, for they shall inherit the earth. Stunning words. There is a certain poetic beauty to uh, the words of Jesus, and they are very familiar to us, and we are drawn to that poetic quality. But sadly, because the words are so familiar, the impact of what Jesus is actually saying is sometimes lost on us. This has truly been my experience. Uh, as I read the scriptures again and again, um, I, I become somewhat hardened to, to what is being said. Oh, I've heard that before, or uh, I've studied that before, I have it all figured out. Um, but. Uh, this statement of Jesus, blessed are the meek and lowly, for they shall inherit the earth. When Jesus uttered those words, he was throwing down the gauntlet. People were startled by such a statement, because that's not what the world teaches. The world teaches to get ahead, you have to recognize and value your self-interest and value who you are to such an extent that you will pursue your interest above that of others. And so the way to get ahead in the world is to enter into the great game of life, which is highly competitive. And so we are seduced and drawn into a behavior pattern in our daily lives that is striving against others, looking out for number one. This is the natural tendency of human beings. So it will be the proud, the strong, the rich that will inherit the earth. We actually believe this. Even though we would not say it so explicitly with our words, our behavior betrays us. And the whole system of the world, the value system that governs nations and corporations and uh, towns and villages and all human beings is driven by this idea you have to strive and compete and be better than everyone else. And it is important for everyone in my life to recognize just how good I am. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you, you may not think uh, that I am such an egotist, but uh, uh, I, I'm a married person. And, uh, and so I have a mirror that lives in my home. That mirror is called my spouse. And the moment I start to believe my own press and start becoming impressed with myself, I have my wife to reflect back to me all of my defects and all of my shortcomings. And again, I am reminded I'm a man of great limitation, uh, a man of limited patience and uh, limited ability. And so I find that the married life is a great life for keeping one humble. How many uh, of my brothers agree with that? Yeah, I, I won't ask the sisters. They already know the answer to that question. But uh, it, it is uh, something that uh, is counterintuitive because we tend to be focused on our self-interest in order to get ahead. That is what the world tells us. And Jesus says something very radically. It's not going to be the rich and the powerful, the well-to-do and the popular that are going to inherit the earth, but rather it will be the meek and the lowly, the humble of the world. Every spiritual teacher of any substance in any world throughout human history has always spoken about this great spiritual truth, this great teaching of wisdom, and it's the way of humility. And that rubs against the ego because the way of humility 
is a way that is so challenging for us because it teaches us to consider others more important than ourselves, to put the interest of others ahead of our own interest. To live in humility is the pathway to living a successful life, according to many spiritual teachers. And they not only taught this in the words, but, the, but by their great example. I'm reminded of the story of the Buddha, um, a great spiritual teacher who lived 500 years, 550 years uh, before Jesus. And uh, the Buddha was one who was uh, the son of a, a great king. He was a prince. And he had everything he wanted, according to the story that comes down to us. Uh, his father spoiled him. He never wanted his son to see any human suffering or deprivation. And so he lived a life that was devoted to feasting and the wearing of the finest clothes and great parties, and he lived sequestered away in his bubble or in his palace where there was no suffering, no death, no pain. He had everything he could possibly want. Even a marriage was arranged for him with a beautiful woman. And yet, this prince, young prince, decided he wanted to see what the outside world was really like. If life is so wonderful in here, how much better it must be on the outside. But when he went on the outside on his travels, he saw things that shocked him and drove him to despair. He saw suffering. He beheld poverty. He beheld death. He beheld disease, and he realized that it compared with reality that his life sequestered away in the palace was really no life at all. It was an illusion. It did not compare with the reality of how most human beings live. And so he ran away from home. Can you imagine that? Because he wanted to seek after enlightenment. And he becomes known to us as the one who was awake, the Buddha. He gave up all of his wealth, he gave up all of his privilege, all of his riches in order to pursue the truth. And the truth that he talked about included the reality of humility, which his life was an expression of. And so the story of the Buddha becomes a shadow or a prophetic forerunner of the story of Jesus, because the story of Jesus is much the same. I'm reminded of that great passage that St. Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, that Jesus uh, emptied himself of all privilege, of all power. He became incarnate. He lowered himself and became a human being. This is the devotion of the ancient church. It's a liturgical hymn. It's the story of the Son of God who descends from heavenly glory and takes the form of a servant. And he serves others. And he's not even recognized by those around him as being the one who's deserving of all glory and all homage and all worship. And he even gave up his life for his friends. And he gave himself up to a shameful death, for indeed, crucifixion was the most humiliating kind of death that there could possibly be. Jesus was a man who was willing to give himself up to humiliation. And in the story of the gospel we hear today, Jesus now is in a crisis of faith. We know that Jesus had already uh, received the terrible news that his friend John the Baptist was murdered by Herod Antipas. And Jesus, having heard this news, flees the country. He flees for fear of his life. We're not used to looking at the human Jesus when we read the gospel narratives. We look at that, back at the life of Jesus through the lens of the resurrection and his victory over death. And so when we think of Jesus, we think of the divine Son of God who has all power, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So it's hard for us to conceive that he was a human being just like you and I and that he struggled with the fears and anxieties of life. Jesus, at this point in his life, is deeply troubled. But he chooses after a time of retreat in a foreign country. He was in Lebanon. He chooses to return to Israel to embrace his destiny. And that required 
the practice of humility. He had to lower himself. He did not live for self-interest. He was looking out for the interest of you and me, of others, of his disciples, of the nation of Israel, of the human race. And so he gave up the safety of his refuge and he returns to embrace his destiny. And his teaching now changes. When Jesus began his ministry, he had such an optimistic spirit about him. His teaching was so uplifting and positive. But after this defining moment in his life, the death of his friend John the Baptist, the teaching of Jesus takes a much more pessimistic tone. Or some people would say realistic. He begins for the first time to talk about his impending death. How he would be handed over to men who would kill him violently. And yet he would be raised from the dead three days later. His disciples could not understand a word that he was saying. The reason why is because their minds had not yet been transformed. You see, to be a follower of Jesus, my brother and sister, is to have the mind of Christ. It is to have a transformed mind. It is to have a converted heart. We need faith. We need hope. We need love. We need humility. These are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. These are the keys to living the spiritual life, to truly be a follower of Jesus. And yet, somehow, we are not able to muster this up on our own. We're not able to have faith. We're not able to love as we know we are called to love. We fall so very short of these realities. But the life of Jesus has something to teach us in regard to this. And as he's heading back to his home country to embrace his destiny, he speaks to his disciples. They are incomprehending. But the disciples now are speaking to one another. In fact, they are arguing with each other on the road home. They finally arrive in Capernaum, the village that is on the northwest shores of the Sea of Galilee. They enter into the house of Simon Peter. And while they're in the home, Jesus now asks his disciples a question. Usually, it's the disciples who are asking the questions of Jesus, the teacher. But now he asks his disciples, his closest associates, a question. And it's a question that is very revealing. He says to them, what were you guys talking about on the road home? And they fell silent. They were ashamed. Because they were talking about with each other who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They felt they were pretty smart following Jesus. That they were guaranteed a special place in the new order that was coming upon the earth. They were already arguing who was going to be the prime minister in the new society that was going to come. They were still caught up in the mind of the world, which is a mind about self-interest. These were the disciples of Jesus. They beheld his miracles. They sat under his teaching, and yet they never got it. They were still thinking in the old way. They needed to have the mind of Christ, which they lacked. They needed a converted heart, which had not yet happened. And so they were still pursuing that which is most utmost important in their life, self-interest. The needs of the ego take precedence over the needs of anyone else. And this kind of narcissistic egocentrism, which is always the bane of human existence, was something that held them in bondage. And when they got the question from Jesus, just what it was that you were talking about on the road home, they were ashamed and only could answer with a deafening silence. But Jesus knew all along what they were talking about. And he says, unless you become like a little child, you'll never enter into the kingdom. You'll miss it all together. Unless you are willing to set aside your own life and live for others, you'll miss eternal life altogether. If you really want to be the greatest in the reign of God, in the rule of God, in the kingdom of God, if you really want to be the greatest, you really want to be on the top of the heap, you want to be in the top 1%, <laughs> you need my 
must give it all away. Be the servant of everyone. You want to be the greatest? Then you have to be the lowest. Because when it comes for people applying and sitting in their resumes to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you would have to have one qualification there, that you were the lowest, that you were the servant of all, that you preferred the interest of others over your own interests. The problem with the world, as James points out in his epistle reading, my brothers and sisters, is the constant pursuit of self-interest. That is the bane of our existence as human beings. This is why we live as human beings with a constant history of violence, warfare, and injustice. This is something that has always been with us from the very beginning, the dawn of human history. And even though we have become more sophisticated with our technology, and we live in the information age, and everything is available to us by a push of a button, the reality is we are still haunted. We are still haunted by this false notion that I have to pursue my own self-interest. But now the gospel of Jesus calls us to another way. <clears throat> Blessed are the humble and meek. Blessed are the meek and lowly. Blessed are those who are at the bottom. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the weak. Blessed are the helpless. For they shall inherit the earth. It won't be the rich and the powerful that will inherit the earth. That is a lie that we have believed in for many, many generations. But rather, it is the poor and the helpless and the weak that will inherit the earth. Why is that? Because Jesus utters this very important spiritual truth that we must get if we are to be successful in this thing that we call life. That is, that we must follow the way of humility. We must follow the way of preferring the interests of others, which is the perfect work of love within our hearts. And how do we receive the mind of Christ? We seek these things from God. For when we seek, we find. When we knock, the door is open to us. When we ask, it is given to us. It is recognizing, my brothers and sisters, that we are utterly and completely dependent on God for everything that we have, even my life. It's my own existence is dependent upon God's grace of allowing me to come into being. You may have several gifts and talents and abilities. You may be very good at doing certain things. But don't think that you have come by that on your own. These are gifts that God has built into your life. God has given you so much in this life. And the only appropriate attitude of humility, the key to spiritual consciousness, is to have a heart of gratitude. And to share what we have because it wasn't ours to begin with. Everything I have, none of it belongs to me. We are all to be called to be good stewards of the gifts we have and to see where need is and to meet that need. To be a follower of Jesus is to set aside the illusion of a self-centered life and to embrace a life that is centered on others. For it's in losing our life that we gain real life. It is in following the way of humility that we gain glory. For you see, the proud and the strong will be humbled. The rich will be sent empty away. But those of us who humble ourselves now, who are willing to give up our life and our self-interest for others now, the poor and the helpless and the meek, they shall be exalted, and it's God who will exalt such people. You want to be exalted? Let God exalt you. For what God exalts, no man can tear down, and what God tears down, no one can lift up. So seek not to lift yourself up, but rather seek to lift up God in your life and look to those who bear the image of God and serve them. You must become like a little child, Jesus says. Why a child? Because in that day, as in our own day, a child is the most helpless and marginalized and weak member of society, the most unimportant considered by some. And we are to become like the unimportant and the powerless. We are to embrace our smallness and our weakness because when we do that and let go of our ego need to be the center of the world, then it's God who will exalt us. 
and we will have discovered the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek and lowly of heart, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are you, my brother and my sister, when you lower your own expectations of this life and elevate the one who has called us into being and to be willing to be servants as he who gave up his life for all of humanity was willing to do. The greatest in the kingdom, my brothers and sisters, is the one who became the servant of everyone and gave up his life for all. May we have that same courage. Let us pray. Shall we stand together as we profess our faith?